to be good to you, and to be good to you this morning. Can we thank God again for being good to us? Hey, can I tell you why I'm absolutely certain God's been good to you? We live in America. <laughs> can we thank the Lord for that? Yeah, yeah. And happy Memorial Day. I thought, I, I, maybe this was just me, but I thought that Memorial Day was only and specifically directed towards uh, military observances. And we are, we are thankful for that, but I was uh, interested to learn this weekend that it's actually just any memorial, it's not just uh, the military. But certainly we want to honor everyone um, this morning who, who has passed, uh, specifically from the military, and then we also want to honor uh, those that have passed just in general. Um, you know, we, we want to memorialize people, we want to remember them, we want to remember the, the good memories that we had together. We want to make sure that their memory doesn't fade, and that's really important. Um, Kayla and I and our daughter, we want to make sure that her memory is alive. And uh, we actually have something specific and special related to the military um, towards the end of the service, and that's why this table is set up for someone that's missing in action, in action and, uh, and can't make it here today. But those things are very moving. I mean, we have usually, if, if you're uh, working a regular public job, perhaps you have Memorial Day tomorrow off, and we don't have service tonight to give you some time with your family and such like that. Um, but freedom is never free. Amen? Amen? Whether it's in the military, whether it's in your home, in your family, or, or whether it's talking about Jesus Christ in the cross, freedom is never free. Somebody paid for that. Somebody paid for that. And today, uh, we honor those that did that. Well, thank you so much for coming uh, this morning. I'm really excited about this morning because uh, we're continuing on in the series on heaven and the heaven series. Is it really for real? And uh, I've just been talking some, about some things related to heaven, and we really want to base this in Scripture. Uh, perhaps, you know, you might have read books or seen things. Uh, maybe people have uh, near-death experiences or after-death experiences where they see things. And, and you know, I, I, I'm no one to deny all that. Hey, if you feel like that's what you saw, then I'm going to go with that. I'm going to trust you, take out your word. But as Christians, we really want to build our hope on the Scripture and you'll be happy to find out that Scripture has some great things to say about heaven. And, and this morning, what I really want to talk about is the heavenly city. The, that thing with streets of gold and pearly gates that, that perhaps you, you've heard about. And I really want to put it in some real terms. I know that you, you know, someone might be able to make a case that some of the things that are written in the Bible uh, related to heaven are figurative. That means they symbolize something. Uh, but I actually take these to be actual literal things, and I'll show you a verse from the passage that we read that kind of illustrates that. But, but this morning, I want to talk about the heavenly city, or it's also known as the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, because there is a current Jerusalem, and it is in Israel right now, okay? But I want to talk about the one that is coming, the heavenly city that God has been preparing, and he has planned for all those that love him to live in forever, for eternity. Okay, it's an amazing thing. I, I spoke about this um, a little earlier in, in the fact that, you know, when our loved ones that follow Jesus pass away right at this moment, they're present with the Lord. And they may actually be living in this city. Uh, I, I don't know that for sure. But we do know that they are present with the Lord and they are in a place of paradise and they will forever be with the Lord with no pain, suffering, or whatever. But. One of the other things I try to teach is that even though that's the present heaven, heaven is going to be relocated on a new earth where you and I are going to receive resurrected, brand new, renovated bodies. It's, it's awesome, right? So what God has planned is that at the end of time, at the end of, or let's say the end of time, but the end of the, the history of the world as we know it today, what's going to happen is uh, God is going to bring a new heavens and a new earth. He's going to resurrect bodies and and make us brand new, and we're going to live on a resurrected, brand new earth, and it's going to be in this heavenly city. Now, today, it's just so overwhelming, I, you know, as far as like what it, you know, what the scripture teaches about this and how it impacts it, that we're just going to spend this morning just reading the scripture, right? Just reading it, and and I'm just going to make some points along the way, but really, everything that I really need to say this morning is in Revelation chapter. 21. So if you have your Bibles you want to follow along, you're certainly welcome to. I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to read all the way through Revelation 21. We're going to read about five verses into Revelation 22. I'm going to be reading this morning out of the New International Version. 
Uh, but if you'd like to follow along with me, Revelation verse 1. So I'm not going to jump around a lot. I'm just going to try to teach what the scripture teaches about this. And I like the NIV and how it puts it. I think it's a fresh way for us to understand the numbers. Okay, so, so there's really no need to set up. Let's just go ahead and dive in to the scripture. Then, this is the Apostle John seeing a vision of heaven, okay? So this is the Apostle John, one of Jesus' earliest followers, seeing a vision of heaven, the one that is to come. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's where we get the whole idea of a new earth, okay? God is going to rejuvenate, resurrect, renovate this earth, okay? But heaven is a real place. Heaven is not just some ethereal place where everything's white and clouds and harps and this and that. No, if you want to look and, and see what God has planned when he really created heaven for us to live in, take a look around and imagine this world without the curse, without death and sin. For the first heaven and the first earth, that's what we're living in right now, had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now, I don't take that to mean any water. We'll figure out why that is later. Um, but the way I kind of thought about this, and again, this is, this is kind of speculation on my part, but I think, you know, when we think about the sea, it divides us, right? Um, there's a sea between us and the continent of Africa. But I think what God has envisioned is that when he brings the new heavens and the new earth, he's going to connect things in a way where there's not the division that we have today. Okay, check this out. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, that is, in the sky, from God, prepared, and listen to the metaphor, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I mean, just tell you, when I got married, da, 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 like, I mean, she came through, bam, it was like the moment, right? She went through, the, she walked down the aisle, my beautiful wife, it was awesome. That's, that's what heaven's going to look like. We're going to be standing there and... We're just going to see this thing, and it's just going to blow our minds. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Which you might say, Well, Jordan, I cry happy tears sometimes. Does that mean that I'm never going to cry? Well, at least we know that there's not going to be any painful tears. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who said, who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God, and they will be my children. So God is going to be there with us, with our loved ones that follow Christ. And we're going to be together forever and not have to worry about this pain and this death that surrounds us. But listen to the 8th verse where it reminds us, right, that you don't get into heaven by your own works. In fact, if you and I were to be judged by our own behavior, we would never make it in. The only people that get to heaven are the people that follow Jesus, and Jesus was the one that believed this. He told his followers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is what he said. No one comes to the Father except through and by me. So what happens to those people who choose to disobey God and not follow Jesus? Verse 8, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Let me tell you, hell is a real place. Hell is an absolute real place. Just like heaven is a real place, hell is a real place. Just like heaven is eternal and peaceful and has paradise in it forever, hell is an unending place of eternal torment. And we need to let that soak in if we're going to learn about heaven. You know, I'm, I'm going to get to the city, 
But I just want to stop here and say, if you haven't made your salvation, if you haven't made your relationship right with Jesus Christ, make it right right now. You don't need an altar to do that. You can do that right in your seat, just asking Jesus to save you because of what he did on the cross in the resurrection. You might say to yourself, well, Jordan, I don't understand. Why would a loving God send people to hell? God doesn't really send people to hell. He allows people who decide to go there. See, when you and I decide to turn our backs on the cross, we turn our bodies and ourselves toward hell. That's how it works. But to turn to the cross, like so many of us, if not all of us here in this room have done, to turn towards the cross is to turn away from hell and towards heaven. There's only two places people who pass from this life to the next go, heaven or hell, and you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. Just put your faith in Jesus who died for you so that you would not have to die in eternal death. All right, so then what are the angels who's... Communicating to John says, all right, John, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the city. I'm going to show you, and it says this way, I want to show you the bride. Because remember, that's the metaphor, right? That, that the church and the city and the holy eternity of God is like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And so this angel tells John, John, I want to show you this city. You, you haven't seen anything like this city. And in verse 10, this is what... John says, and he, talking about the angel, carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, okay? So again, this is not some weird, you know, nothing place. This is a mountain, right? This is what we're used to. A mountain, it says, a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, and what's the name of the holy city? Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God. So why do we call the, the, the heavenly city, uh, why do we call that the New Jerusalem, we call it the New Jerusalem because that's what Scripture says, right? Jerusalem is where the temple was in the Old Testament. It was the centerpiece. And even today, uh, the, <laughs> the Israelite nation or the, the, the city of Jerusalem, that is like the most expensive and fought after and sought after real estate on the planet. <laughs> like that is like the holy place, right? But, but as Christians, we believe Christ lives in us, so we don't have to go to a specific place to worship him. But God always had a plan when he uh, decided to bless Abraham in the Israelite nation. And so what God has decided that at the end times, right, he, and, and when he redoes this world, he creates a brand new heaven and a new earth. He's going to create a brand new Jerusalem, the capital city of heaven. Now, again, I just, I just want to remind you, we're talking about mountains. We're talking about a city here. Heaven is a very tangible place much like what God created it the first time. God does not want us to live in this nothing world where it's just maybe white all the time and we're just floating on clouds. God wants us to live in like places like Alaska. He wants us to live in beautiful uh, plains and, and canyons. And he wants us to live on a real earth, and he's going to give us a real city. But the beautiful thing about this city is that this heavenly capital city is unlike any city you and I have ever been to. And it's going to house the people of God. And it's amazing. This is, this is what the Apostle John says about the city. Verse 11. It shone, the city, with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Okay? You, you'll have to find that, that this, you know, I used to work for a company that did LED lights and things like that. This city doesn't need an electrical system. <laughs> We're going to find out why. But it's so beautiful. It shines so brightly. It shines with the very glory of God. There's no high electric bills in heaven. <laughs> the power of this thing. It's powered by the glory of God. It shines like a jewel, like a jasper, but instead of just being like a jewel, it's clear as crystal at the same time. There's maybe a translucent side of this. This is, this is amazing. Verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 different gates and 12 with 12 angels at the gates. Now on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember in the Old Testament? Right? Abraham, they had children, and, and then there was 12 tribes that, that kind of came out of that. Jacob had, had these sons, and, and those, those sons, um, 
divvied up into 12 tribes, representatives of Israel. And so God continues to add, you know, some throwback into that. And he puts in uh, on the names of the gates the, the, the names of the tribes of Israel from the Old Testament. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. And the wall of the city, okay, so you've got three gates on each side. It's, it's, it's a square. It's a complete cube. We'll, we'll find that out later. But the wall of the city also had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names or the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so Jesus had 12 disciples, right, in the New Testament. We call these disciples apostles. Because not only were they the closest followers of Jesus, but after his death and resurrection, they began proclaiming the gospel message, the saving message of what Jesus did. And because they were sent out, they were called apostles. Okay, they were called apostles. And these apostles, they had um, unique you know, insight into the teachings of Jesus because absolutely they were his, his followers. You and I are kind of like disciples in that we know Jesus, we hear Jesus, but the apostles were the sent ones, the very first ones from Jesus that planted the whole Christian movement, you know, along with Jesus right when it first started. And so they're included too. So isn't it interesting? You've got these gates and you've got this foundation that, that in the Old Testament you have 12 tribes that God had blessed. And then in the New Testament you have 12 apostles. And these apostles don't just take the message of Jesus to the Israelite nation. They take the message of the gospel to the world. That's our mission, right? That we would help the world, help people experience a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This gospel message is now proclaimed throughout all peoples and all the ends of the earth. Now verse 15. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and high as it is long. So this is what I want you to get in your mind. This, this city is a perfect cube. And scripture teaches, and, and you might have a different translation, it gives you a different number, but uh, one of the NIV and I think other translations, I think, get this really good. It's that it's 12,000 stadia, which doesn't mean anything to us. But what we're talking about when we talk about 12,000 stadia is about 1,400 miles. 1,400 miles long. And it's a cube. Okay, so it's 1,400 miles long. It's 1,400 miles wide. And this is the crazy part, okay? It's 1,400 miles, not 1,400 feet. We're, you're going to see these numbers. 1,400 miles high, okay? Straight up into the air. You and I have really never been into a city like this. To put this just kind of in our perspective, all right, let's look at 1,400 miles wide. If it's 1,400 miles wide and we started here from our church, 4527 Baines Chapel Road, and we headed west, okay, this city, 1,400 miles, would stretch from where we are right now all the way to Amarillo, Texas. That's how long we're talking about. That's about 1,400 miles long. If we were to go kind of from a north to south, we were to think about 1,400 miles long, it would start at Lafayette, Louisiana, and reach all the way, I want you to think about the United States, all the way up to Duluth, Minnesota, right? This is a long time. It would take you days upon days just to walk this. And I don't care if you were going with George Strait, you would not reach Amarillo by morning. If you did this 1,400 miles long, it's an amazing thing. Let's look into the next verse. The Bible says this. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. And so not only do you have the, the length of the city and how wide the city is, but you have the thickness of the walls. Okay? How many of y'all have ever been, maybe all of us, how many of y'all have been ever to Pigeon Forge? Right? Raise your hand. Been to Pigeon Forge? Have you seen this at Pigeon Forge? Have you seen this little, um, this little wheel here? It's in the island. That was kind of a new development that they had. Uh, the island little Ferris wheel here, the, the Great American or the Great Smoky Mountain wheel, is about 200 feet. That's how big it is. Okay, so when you see this, this wheel, it's about 200 feet from this point all the way to the top. That's about 144 cubits. 
So the next time you go back to Pigeon Forge and you look at the island, I want you to see that wheel and think to yourself, that's how thick <laughs> heaven's walls are, right? Not that they would need anybody to like defend it because, again, all the evil people are out of there and only God rules there. But that just gives you an idea of how amazingly built this particular city is. Now, if you remember, I told you that it's not just 1,400 miles long and wide. I said, this is what Scripture says, it's, it's 1,400 miles high. Now, what does that even mean? Well, the Mount Everest, by the way, is about 29,000 elevation. That's just how this works. Okay? Um, I, I did the math, and, and this is just, wrap your mind around, this is how tall the heavenly city is. If it's 1,400 miles from the bottom level all the way to the top in elevation. If you stacked 254 Mount Everest, one on top of another, 254 of them, you still wouldn't reach the ceiling of the heavenly city, New Jerusalem. Still not going to be 1,400 miles long. I mean, that's the biggest mountain that we have that we can even think of. And according to God, in the city that he has been preparing for those that love him, I mean, how many floors, <laughs> how many floors could you fit into one Mount Everest? And then you times that by 254 this city has enough room for us all. It's an amazing place. But the Apostle John goes on to describe how beautiful this city is. Verse 18, the wall is made of jasper. This is a jewel, a gemstone. And the city of pure gold, listen to this again, as pure as glass. So there's this beautiful thing about the heavenly city. Um, its walls, right, 200 feet thick or 144 cubits, but, but there's this transparent side of it to where it's gold, but, but perhaps you can see people on the other side. I mean, there's no city like this. It's, it, the reason is this city was built by God. He didn't have to have construction crews and everything in there, and he, he was able to do it himself. Verse 19, the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, okay, foundation with the city walls. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, and the eleventh jasonin, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Listen to this. Each gate made of a single pearl. I just, you two minds, when we said those 12 foundations, every single one of those foundations are decorated and are adorned with its own specific jewel. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. Unlike anything else. And then it says this, the great street of the city, this is where we get the streets of gold, the great street of the city was of gold. But again, as pure as transparent glass. My, um, my cousin uh, said this, and I don't know where she got it. Maybe she came up with it herself, but it really puts in perspective you know, how things are valued here versus how heaven exists. Obviously, God is the richest being in the universe. He owns everything. He can create anything that he wants to create. But think of how, how hard it is and how hard we work uh, to get gold, right? And to get these precious stones, to get diamonds and all these kind of things. Like we, we strive and we, we, you know, we think about it, we work, you know, uh, our money may represent gold. I don't know how that, all that works. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's a pretty crazy thing. Uh, but in God's mind, gold is like asphalt. <laughs> That's his pavement material, right? So, so the next time, you know, you, you find yourself wishing you had something that you don't have, or wishing that you had a little bit more gold in your life, here's what you need to just think. You know what? <laughs> That's what God makes his streets out of. Like, so God's not obsessed with that. You know, God has all this money, and, and in heaven, he just uses it to pay the streets. Like, that's how much he values it. But it's an amazing, it's a beautiful place. Okay, let's continue to move on. Verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb... And the Lamb is a metaphor for Jesus, right? 
are its temple. Listen to verse 23. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb, Jesus, is its lamp. No power bills, no power companies, no power lines, right? Nobody ever has a power outage. Nobody needs the sun. Heaven is a place of total beauty and total light all the time because the very glory of God illuminates the city that's 1,400 miles long, ever which way that you go. Turn 24, verse 24. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of earth will bring their splendor into it. So again, we see something that we might not ordinarily think about associated with heaven. Scripture says we're talking about nations here. Right? We think, um, uh, and, and perhaps you, you've heard this in prophecy, that at the end of, of, of prophecy of the book of Revelation, that there's going to be a merging of nations, and there's going to be like this one world order, and this and that. <laughs> Let me just tell you, if that ever happens, 100% it's going to fail, <laughs> because uh, mankind, we can't create something that's going to work like that, um, unless it is the Antichrist and all of that, and, and even that doesn't work on the soul level. It, it, it's just complete destruction. Um, but when God creates a new heavens and a new earth, there's, there's actually going to be nations. There's going to be people. And, and they're going to have gifts, and they're going to bring their gifts into the city. See, when we think about heaven, we think of just one little place where we're just going to fly around all the time. And God imagines an entire world like the world we live in, except perfect and without a curse. A world where there's nations. A world where maybe there's civilizations, and there's buildings, and there's architecture, but there's no curse, and there's no uh, crime, and, and there's no you know, person uh, you know, with greed or anything like that. Like It's just an, an amazing place where we get to express what mankind should have been in the very beginning. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations, again, will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What is the Lamb's book of life? Again, that is what um, records the names or the identities of those people that have put their faith in Jesus. When you begin following Jesus... He writes your name on the citizenship roll of heaven. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. All right, let's move on to the next chapter. We're just going to read a few verses here. All right, verse um, 1, chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Now this water in the city was clear as crystal, and it was flowing from the throne of of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street. We're talking about the golden streets, and there's this water, this river of life that flows from the throne in the middle of the streets. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life. The tree of life. What is the tree of life? Well, remember back in the Garden of Eden when God first created the world? I know. Great mission this. He was talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God created a garden in Eden. It was a paradise. Um, he had many different plants there, but he had two specific trees, the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God only gave them one rule, one rule in Eden. That was only one rule. And it was just whatever you do, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You don't want to know what evil's like. <laughs> you don't want to taste that. The moment you disobey me, you will know what evil tastes like. You will know what evil is. And I don't want you to have to endure that. But I'm putting that there, and I'm just telling you, don't eat it. Instead, eat of the tree of life. Now, Adam and Eve, they, they weren't dead. They were immortal beings. There was no death a part of Eden. So what did the tree of life do? I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. It's pretty amazing. I mean, Maybe it was just amazing food that they didn't have to eat, but it just rejuvenated them so well, even though their energy never depleted. I don't, I don't know what it was like, but it, it had to taste amazing. 
Um, but instead of, of really focusing on eating that particular tree, Adam and Eve ate of the wrong tree, and that brought sin into the world, and that wrecked everything, and now we have traffic and you know, hospitals and sickness and death, and, and just everything went wrong. But God, in his infinite wisdom and beauty and holiness, takes the tree of life and has it for us to taste again in the heavenly city forever. But here's what's interesting. In heaven, there's no knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Why? Because we already know what that tree tastes like. We already know what it's like to suffer. We already know what it's like to hurt. We already know what it's like to have struggle. But we have the tree of life. And this is what it says about the tree of life. It says, in the tree of life, okay, bearing 12 crops of fruit, Yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. It, again, I don't believe they're suffering, so I don't know exactly what this healing property is. Um, again, there's no decay. But, but look at how interesting this is. This fruit, it bears its own fruit every month, right? So it, it's just, we're getting more food and more food, and, and we just need to eat it. We don't have to worry about calories, we don't have to worry about sugar, we don't have to worry about diabetes. This is how amazing this tree is. Verse 3, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Verse 5, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. How amazing. Let me just kind of end the sermon and, and our sermon time. Like I said, we have something special planned um, to honor those people that, that are here, specifically the military uh, people of service. But let me just remind us again through the scripture how amazing is what God has prepared for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. I mean, this city that we're looking at, it's beyond anything we've ever thought of before. All the food that you can eat, all the water that's clear as crystal. I mean, can you imagine people running through this city that's incredibly huge? I mean, miles, 1,400 miles long, every other way, and all the way to the top, even if it looked like a pyramid. I mean, how in the world would we ever even get to the top of this thing when it dwarfs the mountains that we have seen here on earth? And there's the throne of God, and there's this beauty. There's these jewels on the foundations of the city. There's these gates that are never shut, and nations go in and out of this beautiful City And there's the tree of life, the tree that we were meant to eat of. I don't know about you, but I like to imagine the fact that broccoli will taste like cinnamon rolls and cauliflower will taste like chocolate. And it's just going to be incredible. But I want us as, as, as Christians, I want us as followers of Jesus to never forget these words. Because perhaps your loved ones that follow Jesus are already there. And they're hanging out. <laughs> and they can't wait for you to get there. I can't wait to get there. And I hope you can't wait to get there either. Let's stand up together. Let's go ahead and bow our, our head in, in prayer. I want to do something um, really unique. Or you know, something we've done before. But, but in, in particular, I know we've got some other things planned. But let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. Because I don't want to close today's service without allowing anyone the opportunity to follow Christ and put their um, their faith in Christ. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, um, we're going to pray a corporate prayer together as a church where we're going to ask Jesus to forgive us our sins and make us right for heaven. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, if, if you don't know where you would spend eternity, this moment, if you, if you passed away right now, I want to give you the opportunity during this time of prayer to just Ask God to forgive you of your sins, forgive you of all the things that you did that were in disobedience to him, and receive the forgiveness that comes from him based upon what he did on the cross and the resurrection. I hope 
that as you've heard about this city, about what heaven is like, it has stirred something inside of you that makes you want to go to heaven even more than before. Because now, as you think about what it must be like, and you can imagine what God has prepared, there's no other place you would want to be. And the good news of the gospel is that we can mark our invitation. We can book our trip to, to heaven through Christ, through the cross and resurrection. So as a church, I just want us to pray. And if that's you, um, I want us to just pray together. Okay, we're going to pray out loud. And we're just going to pray that God will make sure that all of us are ready to go. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for heaven. Thank you, God, that heaven is, is not just a consolation promise. It's, it's something that's left over if our life has been too tough here on earth. But thank you, Lord, that heaven is really beyond anything that we've ever seen. There's, there's no city on earth that stretches from here to Texas and from Lafayette, Louisiana, all the way to Duluth. There's, there's no place that is higher than over 250 Mount Everest and, and has 200... Uh, feet in their walls for their thickness and, and adorned with jewels and, and, and golden streets and pearl gates cut from a single pearl. And yet somehow this place is as clear as crystal in order to shine like a jewel and a gem, the glory of God. Thank you for that city. And it's not just the city, although that's the capital city. It's an entire earth that you will make for us to enjoy your presence forever in a place where we don't even need to turn on lights because your glory will provide that light. Thank you for that place. And thank you, God, that through the cross and through the resurrection, you have opened us and given us a place where we can get there. You've crossed the bridge that divided us. So, Lord, if there's anyone in here that isn't a follower of you, I just pray right now. They ask you, Jesus, to forgive them of their sin and to make them right with you, not because of anything that they have done, but because of what you did through sending your son on the cross and the resurrection. And Lord, for all the other needs that are going on, we've lifted up special prayer and all of this. Lord, we just want to pray for that. And we just want to uh, just have your presence meet people's needs wherever they are. And we thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there any